So when we think about this class, the whole goal of this class is that we can all become a little bit happier. But we might want to ask the question, like, what does that even mean? Like, what does it even actually mean to be happy? Um, if you Google happiness, you get an answer that's a little bit strange. This is what happens when you do a Google image search for happy. Um, you get images that look like this, which if you scroll down and sum up, they can be kind of summed up in three ways. There are smiling emojis, there are people jumping, and there are minions. I don't really like the minions, but they're in there. Um, you all know what minions are. You're like, OK, good. Um, I think this is funny, and it's particularly funny that if you all remember this uh, song that came out by Pharrell when you all were kids. Because I'm happy, I'm alone if you, you watch the video, the video also has uh, smiling emojis and people jumping and minions. So I think there's some like central theme of these three things, but that is not what scientists mean when they talk about happiness. Scientists mean something else. My favorite definition of what scientists means comes from the fantastic positive psychologist Sonia Lubomirsky, who you'll hear some quotes from her throughout this, this class. And so she talks about how science has these two components. The first has to do with the experience of positive emotion. So happy people tend to experience more frequent positive emotions than not so happy people. But that's not really enough, she says. She says a happy person also has to have a sense that their life is good. You need both of these to be happy. She talks about thinking about it as being happy in your life and being happy with your life. And so that's the kind of lay definition of happiness we're going to be using throughout this class. We want to use strategies that promote being happy in your life, so you experience lots of positive emotions, but also being happy with your life. You're kind of satisfied with how your life is going. You think it has purpose. You think it has all the kind of right ingredients to live a good life, right? This is what we're going to try to promote. And this is how scientists think about it. But scientists are nerds, and they often use bigger terms than just happiness. And so the term that you'll often hear scientists use when they talk about it is what's called subjective well-being. And we'll define it here as a person's cognitive evaluation of their life. That's the kind of you're satisfied with your life. You think your life is good. That's the kind of cognitive part. And their affective evaluation of their life. What does it really feel like? What's your affect, your emotions in the moment? That's how we're going to define it. And that's critical because it means that this idea of subjective well-being, we need to think about it as having two parts. One of those parts is the thinking part. You know, you're satisfied with your life. Your life as a whole, you think is going good. It's how you think your life is going. But there's also this affective part, which we could split up into two bits, right? There's the positive affect, like all the good emotions, the positive emotions, things like joy and laughter and so on. And then there's, of course, the affective part that could be the negative emotions, the bad emotions, feeling sad, feeling anxious, and so on, right? And this is where we have to go through a particular misconception that comes up all the time when I, when I frame subjective well-being or happiness this way. People see the affective part of subjective well-being, and they think, aha, all I have to do is feel all the happy, positive emotions all the time. I need to experience joy and laughter and all the good stuff. And I have to get rid of the negative stuff completely, right? Like subjective well-being, having a high subjective well-being, being happy means only positive emotions, no negative emotions. And this is a mistake. This is something that I, I worry about a lot because I don't want this class to imply that you should never feel sad or you should never feel anxious or you should never feel angry. It's sometimes normative. In other words, you're supposed to feel sad when bad, sad things happen. You're supposed to feel angry when like injustices happen. You're supposed to be anxious when there's scary things out there. There's a normative or a kind of correct amount of the stuff you're supposed to experience. We're uh, having a full life and a life that's satisfying is going to have some negative emotions, unfortunately or not, right? Um, and I think that the misnomer comes from how we think about happiness. Again, if we go back to this Google image search, it's like it's, there's no negative emotions on there. It's just like smiling emojis in extreme forms, right? But that's not really what the science shows. What the science shows is what the uh, psychologist Susan David quotes in her book, Emotional Agility, that discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life, right? A meaningful life is going to have some sadness. It's going to have some anger, anxiety. It's going to have all the negative stuff. But that's what's going to make it meaningful. You need that to have a satisfying life. So get rid of this idea that subjective well-being, only positive emotions, no negative stuff. There's going to be negative stuff. That's not our goal, right? The opposite of this, this is toxic positivity, right? And we're really trying to fight to get to the opposite of this. So one misconception out of the way, which is great. But you might be asking, how can we really know what a person's subjective well-being is? Like, how can we measure somebody's happiness? And the answer, again, for better or for worse, is just that we literally just ask them. Um, this is a process that you know, might literally see of like somebody ticking off their happiness in a box. It's what scientists call self-report. This is just a method of testing people's happiness that involves simply asking people about their happiness levels, but also their feelings, their attitudes, their beliefs, and so on. Now, you might think this sounds pretty unscientific, and I'm kind of with you. At first, it's like it sounds like 
one of those cheesy quizzes that you do on the internet about like, I don't know, which Pokemon are you or something silly. Like that's what it sounds like. But it turns out that you can make self-report really scientific. Um, one way that you can make it scientific is that you kind of gear the questions towards these different aspects of people's subjective well-being. So here's what one looks like when we're looking at the cognitive part, how you think your life is going. And you can kind of play along in your head how you'd answer this, right? Here's the question, all things considered, how satisfied with you with your life as a whole, right? From one, not at all satisfied, to seven, I'm pretty satisfied, right? I'm not gonna ask you, but that's basically the question that we use to get at people's cognitive well-being. In terms of people's emotional well-being, you do a similar kind of like survey. In this case, you're gonna have people think about what they've been doing and experiencing over the past month or so, and then report how often you feel these words that I'm gonna show you in a second. From one, very rarely to never, to five, I experience this a lot. And there'll be words like this. How often do you experience positive emotions, negative emotions, good and bad emotions, pleasant and unpleasant emotions? And then we get to some specific words. How often do you feel happy or afraid and so on? And the ones that are in yellow on this slide are ones where we wanna boost those up. The more you have those, that's good for positive emotion and your affective subjective well-being. The more you have the white ones, those are the negative ones that kind of decreases it down. Literally, these are the scientific instruments that people are using. And again, you might be like, does this actually, like how is this scientific just to ask people? And the answer is that, oddly enough, this does seem to work. We know this from studies that really look at how psychometrically we're measuring these kinds of things over time. Like, how does, how, what are the kinds of things when you say you're satisfied with your life on a scale from one to five, what does that correlate with? Does it correlate with stuff that really seems to matter? And from a study like Sandvik and colleagues study that they did back in the 90s, this seems to work. So if you look at people's self-report measures, the very ones that I just showed you, those seem to correlate really nicely with if you did personal long interviews with people, like, and you really interviewed people about their life, just your simple answer to that question, like, am I satisfied with my life, that would correlate with it. It also seems to correlate with if I give you this really lengthy emotional memory test where I have you talk about your memories from the past year or so, what those emotions were like, correlates with that. It also correlates with more detailed methods. Like if I give you a little app that pings you at random times, how are you feeling, how are you feeling, how are you feeling, and gets tons of data, that one question seems to correlate with that pretty well. It also correlates with what other people say is going on. So if I did these, those same detailed personal interviews, but not with you, with all your friends and family members, it seems to correlate with that. And it correlates with more kind of behavioral measures. Like if I kind of followed you in like a creepy way and like videotaped you the whole time and measured how much you smiled across the week, it would end, those self-report measures would end up correlating with that, right? And so the upshot is, as best we can tell, these are pretty good measures for your subjective well-being, both the kind of thinking cognitive part and the emotional part which is exciting because it means we can have a science of this stuff. We can scientifically measure if people are feeling happy or not so happy. And we can look at whether if we change people's behavior, we can change those things around. So we can define happiness and we can measure it, which is pretty cool.